Due to the amazing response and over 350,000 hits on our last walk around the showroom, talking about our current stock, on this episode of Tom Talks, we're going to do an updated tour and we're going to share with you some fantastic new arrivals that came into stock uh, and talk intimately about some certain cars uh, their histories, where they're sat in the market today, and their current values. So, as you can see, you know, we have lots of 1950s and 1960s Ferraris. We have modern supercars such as the Carrera GT, the McLaren, the Bugattis, Ferrari F40s. But I would like to start with this very special Aston Martin. This is a 1960 DB4 GT lightweight. Now, they built 75 DB4 GTs. Of those 75 cars, nine of them were lightweights. And of the nine lightweight cars, only five of them really ever done any period racing. Now, this particular car is a very famous car known as 18 TVX. It's one of the Essex racing stables cars. Um, it was built new, not on the production line, but the, in the experimental department. Sounds a bit like being built by Q for, um, for James Bond. Um, just an amazing history car. It was a, a master project car. It was built there in 1960. Um, and then in 1960 at Goodwood in the TT, the very famous Sterling Moss winning race where he piloted the 250 short wheelbase, the dark blue Rob Walker car to victory. Uh, this particular car in the hands of Roy Salvadori um, came in second place. And probably when you read the, um, the race report, it, it probably was a little bit unfortunate to come into second place. And, you know, it, as famous of a victory that Sterling had that day, this car probably should have been the actual overall winner. Um, but just an amazing car, and a very different car to any normal DB4 GT. And all these DB4 GTs are all special in their own right. Um, however, the lightweight cars, um, of which, as we discussed, there was only nine of them, um, they basically, uh, Aston Martin, this was one of two cars that Aston Martin signed off and said the lightweight project, um, master project number uh, um, uh, DP203, how are we going to lighten the GTs? So they decided to remove all the luxurious seats and they put the DBR1 style seats in, fantastic cool seats. Um, instead of glass and the perspex windows, they drilled the chassis um, in order to save weight. They removed the glove box lid. Uh, they, done, they went all through the cars and said, how can we make this car lighter? How can we make it more competitive? How can we um, make it more of a rival for Ferrari's 250 short wheelbase? And of all of those cars, the couple of standout cars are the TVX, 17 TVX and 18 TVX. Um, they had the best race history, although this car had um, probably much better race history as in race results in 17 TVX. Uh, and then the other real standout lightweight is a 40 MT, the car we sold uh, a few years ago. Um, and I'm so excited to have acquired this car. And uh, you know we're going to be launching it for sale in the next few weeks. Um, the process on this is that we have, uh, I've written down a list of candidates and one by one we'll be carefully going through them. People that I think this car, people who I think should own this car. Um, and let's see how we get on. So moving on, as I say, we uh, the 288 GTO, that's a prototype, that's one of my own cars, a car that uh, is not for sale. I absolutely love it. I feel super fortunate to own it. That's, that's the oldest Ferrari supercar in existence. Uh, it was gifted 
to the one and only owner of Paul Me from uh, Enzo Ferrari as, as, his, as the gentleman's bonus for his performance in the 1983-84 Formula 1 season. Um, and I feel very privileged to own it. Um, this F40, this was Sterling Moss's car, UK supplied, 2,000 miles from the new. I bought this car about a year or so ago, maybe a bit longer now, maybe two years, or 18 months. And again, it's another car that I don't ever see myself uh, selling. You know, I, I unfortunately can't afford to hold on to too many cars, but I like to treat myself maybe to one or two cars a year. And for me, these are my pension fund. You know, I believe in, um, I believe in cars and I believe in the future values of very important collectible cars. And when I manage, I try to acquire the very best of anything and I feel like I've acquired the very best 288 GTO, you know, a very special F40. Um, when you consider its provenance. And for me, I'm in it for the long term. So those cars are going anywhere in my being. Um, Bugatti Veyron Grand Sport, this is a car that we have sold twice in the past. Uh, a fantastic, spectacular color combination. You see too many of these Veyrons in, um, I'm not sure the best way to put it, but a very leery colors, you could say. Two-tone colors that are not in my opinion, it's that aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing. And I think that is a very classy, elegant looking car. Um, it was originally Bugatti's show car. It, uh, they used it for about three years, flew it around the world. Obviously you can understand what it's now when you think about its color combination because Bugatti, Bugatti wanted to present the car in its best light to try and sell the Grand Sports. Um, only 58 Grand Sports were ever produced. Uh, this is a, uh, after Bugatti finished with it, it was sold to um, a very well-known and well-respected collector in Monaco. He'd done about 8,000 kilometers. We bought the car from him and uh, via, um, via someone else. And we sold the car to a good friend we bought it back, sold it to another very good client in Switzerland. And um, for, for other reasons, he decided to sell the car and we've managed to acquire the car again. A great car. It's, what's quite um, unique about this car is that it's got a three-year service pack, pack that's been paid uh, in advance. It's had a new set of tyres and plus there's another new set of tyres that's already been paid for by the previous owner that somebody else can benefit from in the future. And tires on these cars are about 25,000 pounds for a new set of tires. Um, so that's quite an incentive to uh, the next owner. McLaren P1XP. We've done a Tom Talk series on this car before. Um, really special car. This is a car that is absolutely for sale. It's not a car that I own in my own private collection um, but however it is a car that I'm absolutely very patient with I don't think this sounds really daft but I don't think we marketed this car at enough money and I don't think people appreciate the premium that an experimental prototype one of the factory XP cars how much of a premium that should be over a normal production P1 um, and I think it seems a bit silly now to put the price up after we've been marketing it for a while at the level we are, which is £1,350,000. Um, but it's a stunning spec car. Um, McLaren themselves uh, commented that they thought it was one of the best spec P1s that had ever been produced. It's in the historic uh, McLaren Orange. Uh, it's only done 350 miles. It's got impeccable service history, even though it hasn't been driven very much. Uh, we sold the car in the end of 2017 and I tell you we sold it for a lot more than £1,350,000. It was nearer £2 million. Um, now hybrid supercars in general, a LaFerrari, a Porsche 918 Spyder and a McLaren P1 have undoubtedly all came down in price. 
You know, LaFerraris, we were selling for very late twos, you know, sort of two and three quarter million pounds at their peak. And those cars today are closer to two million pounds. Um, they're actually starting to look like decent value. A Porsche 918 Spider, we were selling for one and a quarter million pounds, and those cars are sort of trading at 900,000. And that's because since these cars, their warranties have expired, you know, most of the, that holy trinity were 2013, 14, or 15 cars. And now they're out of manufacturer's warranty. People have been a little bit concerned about how much it's going to cost if one of these batteries need replacing. Um, but it comes to a stage and a level where they're absolutely a no brainer. And McLaren as a company, I'm very fond of. They built some great cars. I think they probably build and have been guilty over the last few years of building too many cars and too many new models. However, that is a true successor to a McLaren F1. I don't believe a Senna is a successor to a McLaren P1, uh, but that's a completely different story and we won't get into that today. But I really think that that car, somebody will look back on in time to come and go, geez, what a buy that was, what amazing value. Um, and for that reason, be very, very patient. If you don't get our asking price, it can sit here forever. I love it anyway. Um, Squiggles. Squiggles is um, great history. We've touched on it before. We've done a Tom Talk series on it before. Uh, it's a factory prototype. It's the development car. Chassis 19R, it was the first car to ever be road registered, first long tail to ever be um, road, officially road converted and road registered, um, fully restored by Lanzanti. A really great car, and that is the original livery. That's how it was launched when Gordon Murray and Ron Dennis and everyone at McLaren unveiled the new long tail design at the end of 1996. That was the car and that was the livery. Porsche Carrera GT, chassis 146. Um, this is a car that we have sold a couple of times in the past. It's a great car, uh, GT Silver with the, with the large color spec, I call it, the Ascot brown leather interior. For me, I think the best colors in these cars are are, is either GT Silver with Ascot Brown, or I think the black with Ascot Brown. I love the Ascot Brown interior. I love the, the wooden gear knob. Um, I think these cars are dated particularly well. You have that Formula One derived V10 engine that sounds phenomenal. It is a really pure analog supercar. I think it's a car that will continue to do very well in price um, over the years to come. I think the car's undervalued at the moment. You know, this is a car that we're talking, um, you know, it starts with a seven in front of it. And at one point they were less than this actually. They were, you know, starting with a five in front of it. And I think these cars have still got a long way to go. When you think about contemporary 911s and the price of a, four liter RS, which is a great car, by the way, um, a GT3 RS. But I always feel that that's the opposite. I think they're a little bit overvalued. You know, I think those cars, are, there's not a big enough gap between something like a four liter RS, 911R, you could put in the same um, bracket. I mean, a 997 Sport Classic. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't get those cars, you know, near on 300,000 pounds. And then you look at it, Carrera GT, a real hypercar, supercar, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, fantastic car to drive, and it's not that much more money in the whole scheme of things. Uh, so that's a car that I, I expect and anticipate that we will sell shortly. Then moving on to, well, moving back in time, we have this 330 GT 2 plus 2. 1966 that's just arrived into stock chassis 8139 that's its original color combination of blue chiaro over beige leather interior total matching number car 
I've never had much to do with 330 GTs or 250 GTEs because I've always actually found, um, how can I put it, we, we make a rod for our own back sometimes because I'm very conscious of every car that leaves here with my name on it. I like it to be on the button. I like somebody to be able to jump in their car, drive it, enjoy it. And I think a few of you know that I suffer a little bit with OCD. I love restoring cars. I love making sure cars are absolutely, they don't all have to be restored, but if they're not very original, then I like them to look um, beautiful. And that costs money. All of those things cost a lot of money. And these cars have never been valuable enough to be able to stomach the money to spend on them in order for us to sell them. And that's why when I was offered this car, and it's, it, it came from such a fantastic home, a, a well-known UK-based Ferrari collector, who, a very well-respected guy, and I knew when he was telling me about his car, I thought, that's going to be on the button, uh, because all of his cars are. And then when I seen it, and you look at the quality of the restoration, and you look at the, all the gaps, all the profiles, um, mechanically I drove the car and it drives absolutely fantastic. And we are selling this car for circa 300,000 pounds. Now, if you pretended that this car was given to you and it cost nothing at all, just your friend gave you the car, and then you said, Tom, would you send it down to your wonderful restorers in Italy and will you restore that car for me? It would look like this and it would cost you the same money. So I really feel like this, um, we might call it the bargain of the showroom. So that car should be sold extremely quickly. And then moving on to something that's way rarer than a 330 GT. And let's be frank, way more special than a 330 GT. Um, is this Ferrari 500 Superfast. But there is a lot of similarities, you know, they're both Pininfarina body cars, and when you look at the little details, um, you know, even the wing vents, the difference between the Series 1 and Series 2 cars on both cars, with the difference between 11 louver wing vents and uh, 3 louver wing vents, and the 5 speed and the 4 speed gearbox, there's a lot of crossover in both cars. And actually, when you look at the shape of both cars, I think undoubtedly a 500 Super Fast for me is a far more beautiful car. But you can see a lot of similarities. They were around in the same period, you know, 1965, 1966, um, Pininfarina bodied. And, and then when you think though, that this car is one and a half million, and I tell you, one and a half million pounds, we have priced this car absolutely on the button. If you look at auction results over the last five years, and you look at what 500 Superfasts have sold at auction, you see a couple of cars that have traded for over $3 million. Um, and I don't think anything has traded starting with one something pounds. We have another one of these cars that that's in Italy that is going through the full restoration process with our friends at Brandley, and that's going to be spectacular. Um, but we couldn't afford to sell that car for one and a half million. We, and there's no way would I dream of doing it. So I, I think this car, we acquired this car after we acquired um, the ones in Italy. We decided if we wanted to buy two of them, we wanted to acquire it at the right price. And this is good value for money. It's a great car, it's an original color combination, it's from 13,000 miles from new, it's got lots of unique features such as the leather, the original leather that's in the car at the moment, that was ordered with new as a special order, it had special order rear seats, there's only two 500 Superfast that were delivered with rear seats from new, um, and it's got the, it, it was one of the very first cars with the Series 2 vents, the three louvers compared to the 11, five-speed gearbox, beautiful condition throughout, great history file as well, really great ownership provenance. We managed to um, get in contact with a previous owner, a guy in Australia who bought the car in the 70s, and he sent us through some 
great period in images of when the car arrived in the 70s, it arrived in Australia in the 70s, and it's really nice to have with the car today. And we then move on to, as my friend Mr. Poulter would describe it, a, a worldly of a 275. This is absolutely spectacular in every single shape and form. Um, original colour combination, this is fresh from restoration from Cremonini. Um, Bonini done the mechanics, uh, Maelli done the interior, Gatti done the electric, all of the best people have worked on this car. Um, and the original configuration is absolutely unique. It's one of the 7,000 series competition cars of which only 10 of them were built. This is probably the purest and the most original of all the left-hand drive cars. Actually, there's another very, very original left-hand drive car in North America um, that would probably uh, claim that title. But this is right up there, you know, total matching numbers, no stories to it. But it was delivered new in this original, in this colour combination of Rosso Rubino over black leather interior. And on, inside the interior, it had the different coloured inlays in the formats, uh, which is really unusual. I've never seen it before in, in one of these. Um, I, I love the GTBC, the, the GTO, 250 GTO style rear vents in the back wings. You know, that for me is of all the 275 variants, even though it's the second down in the series car, which is the short nose competition cars, and not as valuable as the 9000 series car, because the 9000 series car ha has a far more powerful engine. Um, it's a bit like a 250 LM, 275 LM engine on the bonnet. Um, these cars are the prettiest of all of them, the most aggressive looking of all of them. You've got these really seductive vents in the rear wings, you've got the outside fuel filler, you've got the large 140 litre fuel tank. Um, it, it had these Guaranis on it from new. Inside the headlamp um, bowls were painted silver. It had a North American racing team badge fitted to the car and it had the 250 GTO style snap exhaust tailpipes which makes the car sound phenomenal. This is a car that I'm pleased to announce that we've recently sold. We sold whilst the car was in restoration. The new owner already has a 275 GTB and he saw pictures of the car and videos of the work whilst we were carrying out the restoration in Italy, and he said, I need to own that car. So we are so pleased with the home it's going to, and I was so pleased to have managed to have bought that car and um, been part of the process of putting it back to its original specification. Now, if one 275 GTBC out of the 10 doesn't interest you enough, then why not two of the 275 GTBCs out of the 10? This is a right-hand drive car, absolutely undisputable, the best of all the right-hand drive, um, short nose 275 GTBCs. There are only three right-hand drive cars produced. This is um, the purest of all of them. This is a car that I originally bought, great story actually. Um, um, after my brother's wedding in 2009, I flew to Italy and there was an RM Southerly sale at the factory at Marinello. And um, I think it was the last sale they held at the factory. Um, they had another one back in 2017, but the gap between them. And uh, I saw this car in the auction and I absolutely loved it. I, I, I love these early short nose cars. And at the time, um, uh, I tried to buy to the auction, uh, wasn't able to buy it, the reserve was too high, and I thought about this car, and it was like, it was a box that was left unticked, and I thought about this car for a long time, and I kept speaking with um, 
my friend who worked at the auction, uh, Max Gerardo, and I said, what do you, can we buy, can I buy that car? Can you get it for me? And uh, we couldn't get a deal done. And I left it for about a year. And then I started to think about the car more again. And then um, still didn't manage to do a deal. And then I got in touch with the owner direct in 2000. He was a diamond dealer in Australia and we managed to do a deal very quickly. Just how the whole deal, it, it, it really does sit in my memory, how the whole deal went through, um, you know, because I didn't know him, he, he, didn't, he didn't know me and uh, we managed to get an intermediary to, I had somebody to go inspect the car for me and um, after all that hard work of buying the car, it took me three years. I then sold the car within about two days whilst it was at the airport before it was flown home. And I thought at the time that I was Mr. Clever Fox selling the car for making such a good profit. And then for the next eight years, I was absolutely devastated because the hardest thing in my business is to find great stock. And this car went into the hands of another dealer. And that other dealer kind of controlled the car but he sold it to one of his clients and then i didn't know where the car went to and i absolutely loved it and i wanted it back it's like one of my girls and um anyway managed to buy it back in 2020 and also pleased to report with my black gtbc that we've sold this car and it's off to a new home sorry to keep rambling on but i do love that car the story and the history um this car this is another car, 275 GTB, six carburetor, right hand drive, um, chassis 07797. Only 11 of these cars were ever produced. A lot of dealers, when they have them in stock, describe them as only six cars was ever produced. And I still can't work out where they get that number from because I could absolutely categorically confirm that 11 were built in this configuration. Um, this is a car that I bought back in 2000 and 13 and I sent it to our favorite workshops in Italy and Bonini done the body, Cremonini done the paint, Lupi done the interior. Now when these cars were first produced, the 275, they were produced in the short nose configuration which is the slightly um, deeper set uh, front end and it's a shorter nose than the later long nose cars. And the reason they were converted is Ferrari updated after 242 cars, Ferrari decided to make the long nose, make the nose longer because they thought it was st more stable at higher speeds. Um, and then what happened in period, a lot of people took their short nose cars and they had the, body, the front nose modified to the new latest long nose configuration. And this was one of those cars. So the first thing we do when we bought it is give it straight back to Brandley and Brandley converted it back here, all the original box, and they put it back to its original short nose configuration. Um, I chose the color combination myself, uh, Verde Pino with the chocolate brown interior. It was a real showstopper. Uh, I sold the car straight after the restoration. And then we have recently bought it back into stock. Um, the car has not been driven, or it's been driven very little, something like 50 miles. Uh, the gentleman who bought the car didn't really have the opportunity to drive it very much over the last few years. And we have several people at the moment, clients, prospective buyers that we are chatting to about this car, chatting with about this car. Uh, before we launch it for sale. So I expect this car to be sold very quickly. 275 GTS, right-hand drive. Only 14 of these cars were ever produced in right-hand drive. Uh, only, don't remember now yet, there was only 200 275 GTSs were being built in total, 14 in right-hand drive. This is absolutely its original color combination. Um, exterior, interior, original engine, original gearbox, original chassis, original body, and I hope it shows up on the camera, but just a beautifully restored car. Absolutely, if you have a list of boxes to tick, and you say, well, what lets the car down? 
there wouldn't be any boxes you'd be ticking about on Let's Take Our Down. This absolutely ticks every single box. The quality of the restoration, um, the previous owner owned it for a long time. And I tell you, sometimes I buy cars off of people. Sometimes I buy cars, um, I, I will, I, if I don't like, if I'm concerned about the home that the car comes from, and I think it's probably not been kept very well, you know, I don't feel like it's the most trustworthy home, then I can maybe walk away from a deal. On this particular car, on this particular client who owned this car, I would have been happy to have paid him for the car before I even inspected it. Come from a fantastic home, a real gentleman, and I'm really pleased to buy that. Um, Ferrari, two Ferrari 500 Mondials. So the difference between these two cars, it's fantastic to see them both together actually, because um, although they're very similar, both Ferrari 500 Mondials, and they both have their matching number status. So, you know, original engine, original gearbox, this car is absolutely unrestored. This is one of the most original open sports racing Ferraris in existence, um, of all the sports racing Ferraris that is. Original color combination, it had a fantastic story. It um, had some local Italian period race history. Um, then the car went back to the factory when it went back to the factory, um, it was put into storage in about 19, it was in the, it was about 1957, it was put into storage. So when the car was only a couple of years old uh, and the guy didn't pay his bills. He didn't pay Ferrari the money that he owed them for the storage charges for the maintenance of the car. So Ferrari ended up repainting the car red and put it in their museum at Monza. Now, the car would sit there for something like 20 years from memory. Um, and it was then sold, uh, sold to quite a, a well-known gentleman today. Uh, he used the car at several events. He took the car to different Concours events. And then about 10 years ago, um, a really great, French collector bought the car and he sent it to a company, a really good um, restoration firm in Italy called Quality Cars down in Padua. And they started to peel the red paint back that was on top of the car and they found all the original paint underneath. So they carefully went through a process of just removing the red paint that Ferrari must have just quickly sprayed over the top so they could put in their museum and back in the 50s you know ferrari themselves i'm sure you know ferrari and rosso it was all hand in hand and they probably didn't want to display one of their cars in blue which today is a huge pro uh, back in the 50s they probably just wanted all of their cars red um so it's absolutely original it's a uh, series two example where there's only 11 series two cars this is a series one example this has got, this is, although it's matching numbers, it's absolutely totally restored. Um, got a fantastic little design feature, um, the Scaglietti. Uh, this is, as far as I know, unique to, to all 500 Mondials. This is the only car with that feature on it. Uh, the trim on the side. It was in the Ferrari yearbook in 1955. It was the winner of the 1950. The five Ethiopia, Ethiopia Grand Prix. Um, I actually bought the car a few years ago and I uh, took it on the Mille Miglia. It was a fantastic experience on the Mille Miglia. Um, you know, I've got some great videos of car in pouring down rain and hailstones coming down. And um, I always think about this car when people are concerned about driving cars that have been restored. And often a client will say to me, oh, the only problem with buying a car when it's beautifully restored, Tom, is I'm frightened to use it. And I say, oh, why would you be frightened to use it? And they say, well, it's so beautiful. And if I get stone chips on it, it's then ruined. Every time somebody says that to me, I'm going to send them the video 
of me on the millimilia because this car I thought was trashed. It had water in the interior, puddles of water in the interior, obviously driving a thousand miles over Italy from one side to the other on those roads. I expected to pick up a hell of a lot of stone chips and this car since the Mila Maria has only been detailed by our fantastic detailing guys. And when you look at it today, it's absolutely perfect. I don't see anything wrong with it whatsoever. It's good enough to be displayed back at Pebble Beach where it's been displayed before. Um, this car used to belong to a really uh, special, not just Ferrari collector, but car collector, John Shirley, who um, was part of Microsoft. And that's who owned the car before I bought it. Um, just a, a really good car. So between both of these cars, it just depends whether you want a restored one or an unrestored one. And I know all of you are going to be writing some comments and going, well, what's the difference in price then? What do you think should be the difference in price between restored and unrestored? Bearing in mind that the cost of a restoration today on a car like this would be something in the circa of $500,000. Well, the price difference, which may surprise some of you, is that this car is circa a million dollars more valuable than that car. And that's for the simple reason that this isn't just an old car. This is an absolute original reference car. And just remember, cars are only original once. A very pure car, a beautiful, correct restoration. I love restored cars, but I also very much appreciate um, preserved cars. And I'm definitely a promoter of the fact of if you have something that's totally original, make sure you keep it that way. Because in years to come, it is definitely a reference point. Now, moving on. One of my favorite cars of all time, and one of my favorite of my own cars, is the Lamborghini Miura S. Right-hand drive. I've owned this car for about, I don't know, um, 10 years maybe, eight, 10 years. And when I had bought it, it had done something like 12 or 13,000 original miles from new. It's now done 17,000 miles. So for me, that's a hell of a lot of driving a car that's uh, 50 years old. Um, really great history, very low mileage from new, all total, totally original interior. This is the original color, but at one point in the car's life, it was repainted red, uh, Rosso, basically Rosso red, uh, which I'm not the biggest fan of. In Mures, for me, I think it should be one of the vibrant, so if it's the orange, the lime green, we have, by the way, a Verde Miura, um, Lamborghini Miura in restoration at the moment with Cremonini. It might be worth pointing that out because there might be somebody watching it who decides that, yes, I also want a Miura. That's a left-hand drive car, P400. Um, actually, that, that brings me on to something. The difference between all of these Miuras, you have a P400, a Miura S, and a Miura SV. Now the Miura SV has got a little bit more power than a Miura S. Um, a Miura S and a P400 are very similar. Um, but what I love about the early cars, the P400 and the S's, and when I had a choice of buying a Miura for myself, this is the model that I chose because one of the most famous features, which is the eyelashes around the front headlamps, did not exist on the more, more powerful Miura SV. And in addition, the rear arches, they widened, flared, and I think it absolutely spoils the clean Bertone design. Uh, and it's not the way the car was designed and originally launched and presented. So I decided to go with a Miura S. Now an SV is actually worth more money. They're a little bit rarer and a little bit more powerful. In 20 years time, will that gap maybe change? We don't know. But you know, I'm very happy and that's the car that I chose to buy and I absolutely love my S. So I decided to repaint it back to its original colour. This car has not been restored. If you saw the car here, because of the quality of the um, paintwork, 
you would uh, instantly go, oh, it's been restored. It has not been restored. We don't misdescribe cars. This is a very original car that has been refurbished. There is a difference between refurbished and restored. Now, if we're going to talk about restorations, this, my friends, must go down as one of the most expensive restorations on a car that we have ever handled. It, that's a pretty bold statement. I'm just trying to think if that's true or not, and I think it is. I am so pleased that I did not have to pay for this restoration. Um, this was restored by the great Gray Moss, RC Moss, which is the king of Bentley restorations. If you want a WO Bentley restored, probably look no further. Um, four and a half litre, give you some bullet points about this car. This is known as the Johnny Green Bentley. Now, for a lot of you people that are watching, you'll have maybe have no interest in W.O. Bentleys or no interest in, uh, or, or no knowledge of Johnny Green, but Johnny Green was Mr. Bentley. He was the founder of the Bentley Owners Club in, um, in the UK. He wrote books on Bentleys. And this car was owned by a gentleman uh, that before the war put it into storage. So it was about the mid thirties he decided to literally put the car on blocks in a lock-up garage. Uh, he kept the car forever. The war came and passed. Um, and then Johnny Green launched this book. Big Bentley fan. His car was still in storage. He took his book, tried to locate Johnny Green. This was in the 80s. His car had been in storage for nearly 50 years. Tried to locate Johnny Green, located Johnny Green, and he's like, hey, Johnny, uh, would you sign my book for me? As you're the author, I love Bentleys. Johnny Green got chatting with him and found out that he owned this car. And he's like, hello, need to go and have a look at it. So went to have a look at the car, was amazed at how, this is Mr. Bentley, Mr. Johnny Green, amazed at how original it was, you know, probably the most original four and a half litre of them all. And he bought it. So he would own the car for several years. He took it to Villa, Villa d'Este. Um, he was known, this was his car. It was in green at the time. Um, this is the original color, but it got repainted in green in the 30s, in the early 30s. Um, and then the car went into the hands of Peter Lovarnos. Peter Lovarnos is a fantastic collector, uh, a real project man, a guy who loves to take car and goes through the whole process. He doesn't need to get out and do 10,000 miles a year. He doesn't have to drive at the Minimilia or the Colorado Grand. He loves the ownership of the cars. And he took the most original four and a half litre Bentley. He gave it to Graham Moss with full carte blanche on whatever it costs, do it. And he said, I want you to restore this and make it the finest restored W.O. Bentley on the planet. And they went to such a great length in all the fine details. And the one real big point about this car was the body, this fabric body that is um, known on a lot of, you know, most uh, W.O. Bentleys were ordered new and delivered new with this fabric body rather than the aluminium panel work. Um, and when the, these cars have been getting restored for the last however many decades, this wreck scene was not correct, basically was not correct. It was just a fabric body that was put on the car. So all these fantastic blowers, eight liters, speed sixes, everything that had been getting restored for decades had been getting restored wrong. They located the only, the, the last wreck scene machine on in the UK, it might be the face of the planet. Um, they managed to buy it. They had to get a crane to lift it out of a, um, a building that was about to be destroyed. The crane had to lift it over the railway line. It was an unbelievable extent they went to, to be able to get the exact correct material and reproduce the correct material that they were producing from new. And this car has dozens of other little reference features that even Graham Moss said, until I worked on this car, 
I didn't realize that this was like this or that was like that because there's nobody still around today that was building these cars in period. So it's the knowledge, you know, you need to take cars that are reference points and you need to be able to take as many photos as possible and then use them as the cars to refer back to. Um, then we go into our Formula One Grand Prix corner. Sorry for blabbering on too much, by the way, about the Bentley, but I absolutely love that car. I use that car since the weather's good, so um, sorry to afford you so much. Now, I'm gonna try and excite you all in case you are still watching and you haven't clicked off after um, rambling on so much about the Bentley. Um, this is the most important um, Grand Prix Ferrari on the planet. This is the Niki Lauda 1975 championship winning Ferrari 312T chassis 23. This is a six time Grand Prix winner. Won the championship in 75, including Monaco in 75. The only person who have ever driven this car was Niki Lauda. This car was put in, um, this car was bought by two great French collectors, one initially off of Enzo Ferrari, and then he sold it to another great French collector who owned the car for basically the best part of 40 years um, until I bought it off of him last year. Um, I'm sad to say that I've sold this car. Uh, at the time I was really pleased, and I suppose it's a stupid thing to say because I'm a car dealer and we made a good profit. Uh, and I shouldn't have any regrets. However, this is a standout car of all the cars that I can ever remember buying and selling throughout my career as being absolutely unrepeatable. I don't know if this car will ever come back up for sale ever again. This car is, when you look at, when you look at um, the value and the prices that modern art sculptures achieve, you know, I, I clicked on something and I saw a bunny rabbit that sold for $209 million and that just worked that one out. Um, I suppose that's because I'm not really into bunny rabbits and uh, I'm not really into whoever the artist was, Jeff Koons or, um, this is just, this, is, this for me is my modern art sculpture. If I could have afforded to have just kept it and forgot about it and let it be another Mura or a 288 GTO or an F40, then I would absolutely, even if it caused me a divorce, I would put this in my hallway and I would look at it every day. This is just unbelievable. Um, but anyway, it will be leaving us soon. We're going to manage the recommissioning with the factory. We want to go back to the factory. They're the best people to work on this car. We have the knowledge, the expertise, the bodywork is not allowed to be touched. I mean, you see the Scuderia shield that is peeling in places and you see the color of the bodywork has faded and a few chips, but that's what makes this car fantastic. That's going back to what we spoke about on the Monday. That's the originality. That's the, you know, this car is only original once and the worst thing that could happen to it is send it away for restoration and it comes out all glossy like chassis 22 that we sold in, we sold that in, late 2019, which was the sister car, another great car, but it actually only had one Grand Prix win compared to this car that had six Grand Prix wins. And this is the most successful, the most winningest F1, Ferrari F1 chassis, apart from there has been one Schumacher car that eclipsed it since. But to be fair, the Schumacher era, you know, a good friend of mine, um, He'll know who he is if he's watching this, who's very much into these cars. He calls that, that era the plastic era. You know, it, it's not the same. It's not comparing apples with apples. You know, it, to win six races back in this era in one chassis was way more significant than winning seven races in 2004 when Ferrari were just, you know, um, there was Ferrari racing against Ferrari, who was racing against Ferrari. And then, you know, there was orders saying, well, no, actually this race will get you to win and not you to win. And that did not happen back in 1975 and 76. Um, FW15C, we spoke about that in the last 
walk around, so I'm not going to bore you with that today, and the FW17. This is a new arrival. This is a March 701 Jackie Stewart Grand Prix winning car. Um, yeah, very special and very rare because it's a Jackie Stewart Grand Prix winning car. Now, I've spoken about this before, and because I invest my own money into these cars, um, I'm very, um, I'm very choosy with what I buy. And for me, it has to have won a race. You know, I want Grand Prix winning cars. I want to be able to tell a story and say, this is a car that James Hunt, Nicky Lauda, Lewis Hamilton, Michael Schumacher, whoever had won a race in. And what I really want is I want a car that's won a race and I want a car that's won a race by a world champion. And if you can then buy a car that has won multiple races by a world champion in his world championship year, louder, then you've hit jackpot. That's when it goes, you know, sky high. But to be able to acquire a Jackie Stewart Grand Prix winning car is, you know, it's pretty rare indeed because although Jackie won a lot of races, um, he didn't win a lot of races in many different chassis. And then when you also look that he has one of his own cars, Paul, his son, has one of his own cars, um, Mark, his son, has one of his own cars, there isn't many other cars in existence. And Jackie Stewart is an absolute icon of the sport, a legend. He's one of those drivers that you chuck in the ring to say, was he one of the, was he the greatest driver of all time? So, very special car. And that's the car that I bought to try and get into some modern, modern historic um, Grand Prix racing. Uh, that I thought was a perfect car for me to do it in. I want to do it safely. I'm doing it with Hall and Hall. Rob Hall is helping me through the process, um, giving me guidance along the way. I need lots of guidance. I even need to know which way to turn. Um, I haven't ever driven, I mean, I drove those Williams, but you know, racing is very different to just driving a car around a track on a test day. So let's see how it goes. Hopefully it's going to go safely. Um, Lancia Stratos. 1974 Lancia Stratos, 6,000 kilometers from new, super original. Lancia Stratos, um, you know, what a retro car, what an iconic car. Um, they basically shared the same engine as a Ferrari Dino, but considerably lighter. Um, and most famous for being a great rally car. Uh, this is a car that's just been a road car from new. This is its original colour, um, original spec interior, 6,000 kilometres, unbroken provenance. We put this car up for sale £485,000. I think, you know, that's the price of these cars were probably £250,000 eight years ago. So somebody would look at that and say, that's a. Um, that's a huge hike, but I would also say, going back to comparing apples with apples, is that buying a 6,000 kilometer original warranted mileage from new is unrepeatable, and you should always try and buy the best of the best. That's what I do. I'm never frightened to pay a good price or a big price for a great car, and it's always stood me in pretty good stead. Um, 512 Boxer. Uh, a BBI, an injection car, not a carburetor car, left-hand drive, Ferrari Classic A certified, original chassis, engine, body, gearbox, original colours. Um, I'm actually not a big fan of a boxer. I would never particularly want to own one myself, um, but that doesn't mean that a lot of other people don't, and a lot of other people do. We've sold many boxers. This car, I suppose when, when we acquire a car in stock that I don't particularly like, um, I just like it to be priced at a level where it looks super attractive and it just goes out the door. And I think that would fall into, this car would fall into that bracket. It's priced for £199,500. Now, 
it's a really nice car. You know, we don't, you know, we wouldn't have a Boxer unless it was really nice. And this is a very nice car, and all matching numbers for less than two hundred thousand pounds. I think that's very good value. Um, Porsche selection. Now you'll see here a row of nine nine threes. I have gone on a real nine nine three kick. Nostalgia springs to mind. You know, when I was um, growing up, the first car I ever sold actually was a 993 Carrera 2 convertible. Um, I was a child. And, uh, and I also remember this was a car that my, my father would always um, operate in regularly. You know, we always had 993s. And uh, I suppose the first car I ever remember being in the passenger seat with him and I used to watch him change gears was a 964. Um, and then when the 993 first came out, you know, I, I'd spent so long, and I'm not a Porsche guy as it happens, I'm not a Porsche guy compared to Ferrari, but I'd spent so long in these cars, because, you know, we always used to have 993s, that I, I know them particularly well, and all the models and the colors and the extras and what you can have as factory options. Um, and this, you know, is a really rare 993 RS, right-hand drive, uh, probably the most original of all the right-hand drive cars left in the UK. 7,000 miles from new, completely original paint. I even think things like the Speedline um, alloy wheels, you know, the Speedline wheels, the, all the bolts have never been taken apart. Everything on the car is exactly as it was when it left the factory. So much so that even in the sticker in the rear window, the supply and dealer's sticker, Isaac Agnew, which is the Porsche dealer in Northern Ireland. Straight away, um, my detailers was told, don't remove that sticker. You know, I want it to be exactly like it was when it left the factory, when it left the dealer, when it was new. And even though selfishly we could remove that sticker today and put one of our own stickers in, I think it's nice to leave the original dealer sticker in. And, um, Moving on, 993 Turbo S. Only 23 of these cars were ever built. UK right-hand drive cars were ever produced. 23. What a colour. It reminds me of, uh, I don't know, what is it? Is it ben Benedict's chocolate? Or some type of mint chocolate? And um, this car belonged to somebody in the north of England. I went up with my son on a Saturday, not to buy this car, but to go and look at his collection, because he'd been inviting me for a while to look at his collection. And when I was walking around, I had recently bought some other 993s, and I fancy a 993 Turbo S, and I also want to buy a 993 GT2. Um, and when I was walking around, I saw this car, and the colour by the way, the colour, when it was, although it sold itself to me, and I absolutely, I think the colour is spectacular. The, the funny thing is how fashion changes. Um, now everybody wants a car in a unique colour or in a rare colour. It's worth a huge premium. But when this car was new, this colour, which is known as Ocean Jade, was like the kiss of death. It wasn't desirable. Uh, people wanted Arctic silver. Or, or, or black, or, um, you know, e even the dark blue, maybe. But colours like Ocean Jade, it was, you know, quite a leery, loud colour, wasn't a safe bet, and it actually would have been worth a lot less in 1998 than an Arctic Silver car. And these days, it's probably worth a 20% premium. Uh, low mileage, 20,000 miles. It's not super low mileage, but I'd call it... I suppose I'm going to correct myself and say that's nice mileage, but the condition is absolutely fantastic. And um, when I was walking around his collection, I said, right, okay, the car I'd like you to sell me is the Turbo S, um, and which he really didn't, initially didn't want to sell me the car, but then we did a deal. The only bad thing about this was that I had to spin a coin for the last 10,000 and lost. So anyway, it's just life. Um, 993 Carrera 4S, 
everybody sees in the, in the showroom and goes, oh, 993 Turbo. It's not a turbo, it's a 993 Carrera 4S with a factory turbo body kit from new, 6,000 miles from new, Zenith blue, gray interior, all original again. Um, you know, I like those wide body cars. I like the 993 Turbo. Turbo S is obviously a different lead. I also like the 993 Carrera 2S. Uh, this is a 993 Carrera 4 convertible. And I mentioned earlier that I'd spent, I spent so long with the 993s and you know, I know the ins and outs and factory options. And now I'm going to sound a little bit silly because I've never seen the 993 in that colour ever. Didn't think it existed, never seen one in that colour. Um, and even since I bought the car, I've tried to find another 993 in that colour and I still haven't seen one. It's called Turquoise Blue. Um, I think I might have seen a Porsche 968 in that colour, but not seen a 993. Um, it was originally sold new to Paul Gascoigne. The number plate on the car is N1, N for the year, 1, RFC, Romeo Foxtrot Charlie, or Rangers Football Club. Supplied new by Glenn Vargill in Edinburgh. And uh, the story goes that Paul Gascoigne bought the car when he signed for Rangers. Uh, he was the first owner, and then the car has only had another two owners in the last 24 years. And uh, we bought the car recently. All of these 993s, I think there's a lot of growth in these cars. I think if you buy really great 993s, I think over the next 10 years or five years, I think we'll see a, a huge price hike. But I might be wrong, but we have got our money where our mouth is and we bought some cars, so let's see. Um, from the same era, still talking about a bit of nostalgia, 355s. I don't like F1 355s, 355 F1s. I love manual 355s. They were the first really good, they were the first really good Ferrari since maybe the Dino. You know, those 308s I were never a fan of. I mentioned earlier I was not a fan of the 512 boxers, not really a fan of the Testarossa. Um, don't get confused, not 250 Testarossa we're talking about, we're talking about an 80s Testarossa. Not a fan of the 512 TR, not a fan, not a fan of none of the 412s or the Mondials. And then Ferrari, not a fan of the 348. And then Ferrari brought the 355 out, and the 355 was an absolute game changer. It was suddenly a super well built, reliable car, nimble car to drive. It was you know, that go-kart, small V8 car that you can throw around. Um, and I absolutely love them. And again, they fit in the same brackets as the 993s. I think they're undervalued. We sell Ferrari Dinos, depending on the car, but anywhere from sort of £300,000 to nearly £600,000 for the very unique spec, fabulously restored chairs and flares versions. And when you look at 355, it's something like 100,000 or a little bit over 100,000. And you think, I wonder if you wind the top board in 20 years' time, and you, you consider the, the demographic of buyer then. Will they probably want to own a 355 or a Dino? There may well be a lot more people that um, are definitely very interested in buying great 355s. And I think these cars have got a long way to go. And I'd love to buy some special colored one so if there's anyone out there who's got you know a really low mileage manual 355 in blue yellow silver gts berlinetta spider any manual version any low mileage please call us we will pay you more than anybody else and the same goes for 993s low mileage 993s and preferably please not in Arctic silver or polar silver in a really interesting colour. Want, 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 want. Um, what else? So we have the old one that's all on the front of the 430 Spider. Um, 2008 430 Spider. We don't really, this is quite unusual to see this 
in here, but you look at things like the Rolls-Royce Phantom and the Ferrari 430 Spider, and you think, well, that doesn't quite sit in place. They're, they're not collectible cars. You, know, you could argue that a 430 might be a modern classic, but the Phantom is, is not a collectible car. It's probably going to be worth less money in six months than it is today, and less money in 18 months than it's worth in six. Um, but this comes from the fact of um, all our clients, we like to take care of all of their car needs. So if I show you next door, we've got a new G63 AMG that's going out to a very good client. We've got a new Rolls Royce that's going out to a very good client because we try and manage all of their needs. And then what happens is that when they're finished with a car that we might have supplied them when they were new, they'll just call up and say, hey, do you want to buy my Phantom? And I sold this to a guy in 2011 when it was a new car. And, you know, I love doing deals. Um, I suppose I'm a real dealer, used car dealer. Um, so we end up buying them back. And when we do buy them back, we try and take our expertise and our fastidiousness you know, it, from the classic car world. You know, when we spend two weeks preparing a 275 for sale, detailing it, and then we'll put that same type of expertise into a 430 Spider, and it then turns into being a very easy sale for us because when you compare it with what other Ferrari dealers or specialist dealers have for sale and how they prepare their cars compared to the money we spend on our cars, I mean, the condition of this, um, I walked around it today and, you know, it's just perfect, absolutely perfect. 12,000 miles from new, we will sell this car for 85,000 pounds. And then just giving you a little bit of a taste of diversity from this Formula One car, pre-war W.O. Bentley, 993, 430 Spider, And then what about, how about to finish on this um, S2 Continental Fly Expert, 1961, a very well restored car presented in its original color combination. This car has had over a hundred thousand pounds spent on it in the last seven years alone, purely from owners that have maintained the car without any regard to cost. And it changed hands a couple of times. And when it's changed hands, those new owners have given it to people such as P&A Wood, who are the absolute best when it comes to cars of this, um, of this type. And they just, every one of them have said, hey, go through it, make sure the car's on the button, make sure it's perfect. And whenever you do that on a car that's 60 years old, you will always have a list of items. And, you know, if you can afford to, people will go, yeah, just do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. So this car is a really great buy for the next person because you can jump into this knowing that somebody else has spent all the money. It's £195,000 we priced it at. Um, I know our good friend, Mr. Kidston, he seems to smoke one of these around uh, daily. I've never been, that's not my style, not my type. But I think it's um, it's a good car for somebody, this is. And I feel like I should have a bowler cap and I should, uh, I think of the Thomas Crown affair or something, the one with um, Pierce Brosnan and uh, you know Nina Simone singing that song, what is it? Um, Cineman or whatever it's called. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's a great car. Um, and then we will finish probably on this Aston Martin V600 Le Mans. Um, a 2000 car. Um, they only built, uh, you know, 40 of these cars. And this car's the lowest mileage of all of them. It's done just over a thousand miles from new. Uh, we had the car in stock actually for about a year, which has surprised me because we sold three of these cars in a short space of time, um, all for north of 500,000 pounds, somewhere between 500 to 600. This is the last of the real hand-built, brutish Aston Martins. Um, a really, really fantastic car to drive. It's, 
you know, if you open the door, you can sit, if you look at the quality of the leather that's been used uh, when they produce this car, and you also take time to consider how much leather they use when they build these, these cars new. Um, this is car number 1940 ever produced. Uh, Aston Martin Racing Green. Um, it, it came from, it's called a uh, V600 Le Mans. They could have, you could have had them in 550 brake horsepower, 600 brake horsepower. This is the ultimate spec, the close ratio gearbox, 600 brake horsepower. And you see these snorkels in the nose here. This was all, this car was built to um, celebrate and commemorate Aston Martin's success at Le Mans in 1959 when they won with the DBR1. And the color of that car was Aston Racing Green like this. This is a real collector's piece. Um, again, it's a bit like, what car did we talk about earlier? I think it's the McLaren P1, where I said, I don't really care how long we keep this car in stock for. I have no fears of it going down in value. Um, I think this car has good potential and it's unrepeatable. I like owning cars and putting money into cars that I think I can't go and buy the same car tomorrow. So I hope you enjoyed our tour. We have some other really special cars in stock that are not currently here. Um, we have a couple of cars on there way back from flying home from America, North America. Uh, we also have some cars in restoration. Uh, we have a great right hand drive 500 super fast. We have a fantastic right hand drive 275 GTB4. We have a very cool colored Daytona that we've had in Italy for the last 18 months going through the full refurbishment. Um, we have uh, a fantastic factory Polistorico restored um, Lamborghini Countach LP400 Piroscope. Uh, that's a car that will be uh, launching for sale as soon as it arrives back here in a few weeks time. Uh, we just, we do have some crazy good cars in stock at the moment and I hope you've enjoyed the walk around and let us know your thoughts and please stay safe, big virtual hug and I hope to see all of you sometime soon.